very welcome this morning. My name is Richard Horton from the Lancet, and I really want to begin by thanking you for coming and thanking a tremendous team of authors of the series that you have in front of you for work that they've put in over almost two years now. What you're going to hear today is the result of intensive work over that time, inspired by what I think is a classic paper by Ian Chalmers and Paul Glazio from 2009, which um, really ignited a fuse that is burning still very brightly today. And many of the themes that they raised in that paper back in 2009, you will hear uh, explored in much greater depth and importantly with a series of what I hope are, you will think of as very constructive recommendations for the future. I'd also like to thank NIHR for their support of this meeting and for bringing in professional briefings who've helped arrange the events for today. It was the French writer Stendhal who said this many years ago, it's terrifying to think how much research is needed to determine the truth of even the most unimportant fact. And I, the field of medicine that I know best is global health. Um, and I think it's important for me to say at the beginning that I'm very conscious that research has actually contributed many very important facts to our understanding of the predicaments and solutions to some of the problems that we face um, globally today. And I don't want to rehearse all of them, but it's important to say, I think, before we get going, that thanks to the research enterprise, we have a much better understanding of the causes of maternal and child deaths in the world than we, than we had 20 years ago. And that understanding of knowledge uh, about the extent of the problem and what we can do about it has led to, the application of that knowledge has led to a halving of maternal and child deaths over a 20 year period. The discovery, development and delivery of critical interventions to address epidemics of AIDS, malaria and tuberculosis has had an important, perhaps even dramatic impact on the hopes of many millions of people living with those conditions and living at risk of those conditions. As we look ahead, the impact of non-communicable diseases we understand much better thanks to uh, the research enterprise which has documented the problems of non-communicable diseases and is searching for those solutions. So I think it's important to understand that we've made a lot of progress from research but we could do a lot better. It's been a long time since I touched a patient, which is very good for patients, because I'm a very dangerous doctor now. But I trained in the 1980s. And it's interesting to reflect back to what medicine was like just 25 years or so ago. Uh, that was before the era of thrombolysis, before the era of percutaneous intervention for coronary disease before the era of stents. It was before the evidence had been accrued for the benefits of minimally invasive surgery. And it was before we had large-scale randomized trial evidence showing the benefits of statins in reducing risk from heart disease, or even more recently, the evidence of screening for colorectal cancer. So we've really built up a remarkable evidence base over 20 years to change the way medicine is practiced. And I can remember going back to what it was like on a coronary care unit 20 or so years ago. We used to have an age cutoff of 70. And if you were over 70, this is in Birmingham, I don't think Birmingham was that much different to the rest of the world. Uh, if you were over 70, you weren't admitted to CCU. You were cast off to the far-flung reaches of the hospital and lucky if you ever saw a doctor again. But the reason for that was that at that time there was a sense of real indolence and hopelessness and therapeutic nihilism about what one could do because we didn't have the evidence 
reliable evidence to do anything very much. And thankfully, that's changed a lot today. And I can also say that as a patient myself, I've been fortunate to be the beneficiary of publicly funded research, which has certainly made a big difference in my life. So medical research has made a very big contribution to society. But, and there is a huge but attached to this, there have been important and often catastrophic failures of the research enterprise. And we can and we must do better. And today we're going to explore why that is and how we can do better. It's a challenge to the entire research ecosystem, including that bit of the ecosystem that I represent, which is medical journals. What is it when we talk about research delivering a return on investment? What do we mean by that return on investment? What is it that we should be doing to address the often perverse incentives around research that deliver huge rewards and fame and riches for some researchers, but do they really make a substantial difference for patients? When we think about the purpose of regulation, what is regulation for? Is regulation to prevent bad things from happening or to make good things happen? We're very unclear about the purpose of regulation. And how do we put the interests of the patient right at the centre of the research enterprise? That's a question that, truthfully, we rarely address head on. Ian Roberts has been a very important contributor to this, to this series. Um, Ian, a professor at the London School of Hygiene. I just want to quote uh, from an email that he wrote back in 2012 about the series. And he said this, because very much we're talking about the usability of research. We need to consider what we mean by usable. I fear that many reports that would be considered unbiased and usable by researchers are considered impenetrable by doctors and patients, who should be the real judges of usability. And journals have a very critical part to play in this ecosystem. And many of the problems you're going to hear about today are sadly down to the way we communicate research to our fellow doctors and scientists and, of course, to the general public. I'm looking forward very much to learning about what we can do better, but it's a problem that we face collectively. And I really am looking forward to learning a lot about what we can do. So let me hand over immediately to Peter, who's going to give his brief few words of introduction. Peter. Thank you. Uh, and thank you very much for uh, allowing us to, uh, to work with The Lancet and uh, uh, support this meeting. Um, it's hugely important in terms of uh, the department's position and particularly important through the work of the NIHR. And I think this is an opportunity to discuss quite a, uh, a nutty topic. Um, one of the things that the department's very clear about is it funds uh, good quality, high quality research and wants to make sure that gets translated into reality. Uh, as a former chief executive in NHS Trust, um, it was uh, quite astounding how much actual research gets used on the front line sometimes. And that, that is something which needs to be addressed, um, particularly when we've got new treatments, novel treatments, new things coming through the system that are really important to patients and to doctors themselves. Um, I think the, the sort of key themes for us as the NIHR particularly are around making sure we get the high priority research commissioned and done and sorted, that actually it's well designed and it's constructed in a way which is, is positive um, in terms of, of being able to be impactful. Um, we also want to make sure there's good systematic reviews around this area. And I think with the, the work around the James Lind Alliance and the, particularly the, um, uh, the prioritisation of, of research is, is hugely important in that area. Um, and of course, you touched on regulation, and you're going to hear from Janet uh, wisely in a while. Um, you know, regulation is a huge important part of this process. There for safety, but not to be bureaucratic. And I think it's important the balance is set between those two, those two sort of uh, areas. And of course, 
accessible, and I have a huge remit around um, open publications. We've uh, we we're, we're, we're in the NHR now set a, a target for the gold publication standard, which we expect everybody to uh, to operate to who gets our funding. And I think the the important part of that is that actually there's a lot of work which we fund, like the Cochrane uh, collaboration, um, and also the fact that we got last year and Rory's around the room somewhere, but we launched the uh, the NIHR journals library, very much about getting information out in an accessible form with systematic review ar around it. So from a department point of view, this is a really exciting opportunity in terms of discussing quite a nutty subject. It's about ensuring we move forward and actually take the sort of ground that we need to, to, to be on. And I would just implore the meeting to you. I think the papers are excellent, um, and I think the Lancet has done a good job in publishing them. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Ian Chalmers. I'm very glad to be able to start off by thanking both the National Institute for Health Research and the Lancet uh, for the way that they have responded to a paper which was published by Paul Glasgow and me in 2009. Richard's already referred to it. If I could have the first slide, please, of um, the few that I'm going to show. Does someone know how to do that? Or am I not? OK, great. Thank you very much. So this was what it looked like in 2009. Um, fairly um, dramatic claim that um, at least 80% of research funding was being wasted. And 80% of a very large number is a very large number. So it mattered. These wastes are cumulative as you go across from the questions that are being addressed through to um, publication. And I've got to say that I can't ever remember, my first paper published um, was in The Lancet in 1972. I can't remember ever having co-authored a paper which actually had a, a, an impact on anything. Uh, <laughs> And it was absolutely wonderful that this paper did seem to have an impact. And first of all, on a major funder, the National Institute for Health Research. They responded um, incredibly positively. They could have reacted defensively, but they didn't. They had a workshop in 2011 to consider the implications. Um, then um, Glasgow and Chalmers note the order, because that's the way it's been since uh, this particular exercise began, suggested ways in which um, the agenda could be taken forward in uh, the agenda of the 2009 paper. And then a year later, a workshop to consider how to reduce waste across all NIHR programs. And then uh, in s September of last year, a meeting of representatives from the Department of Health and NIHR on adding value in research. They felt probably quite rightly that that was a less confrontational way of describing what was needed than referring to waste. Uh, now, in your conference packs, you have a little um, handout here, which has the information on the, this, this slide and the next one on it. But it shows just how far NIHR has moved to take seriously the issues that we raised in that um, uh, 2009 paper. And um, they added um, a, 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 a fifth column, the one in the middle there, which was about dealing with hyperregulation, unnecessary hyperregulation and bad management of research, which Paul and I had missed out in 2009. But then, starting with a, um, a party in Princess Risborough at Liz and Jim Wager's uh, house, um, Sabine Kleinert um, discussed with me the way that NIHR was reacting to this paper and said, that sounds as if it might be a good uh, topic for a, a Lancet series. And so um, she and uh, Sabine and uh, uh, Richard invited um, Paul and me to submit an outline proposal for a series on waste on research. Um, that was accepted um, a few days later, really. And then uh, the hard work started. So uh, the initial hard work was um, during the first um, eight or nine months of, of 2012. And the way that The Lancet deals with uh, series that are in preparation 
is that uh, it convened a meeting, this one was at the Lancet's office, uh, offices, and um, asked, in this case, um, three researchers, Ulrich Dianangel from uh, Berlin, who's a, a preclinical researcher, an animal researcher, uh, Rory Milne, who will be on the panel later on from NIHR, and Ian Roberts, to whom reference has been made earlier on, to look at the first draft of a series of four papers at that point. The one that I was responsible for, the first paper, was basically torn to shreds. Um, uh, it was, you know, I, I'm used to criticism, but this really was <laughs> um, uh, really important criticism because the, the, the main point they made was that we tried to cover too much in that initial paper. So what happened as a consequence of that was that instead of trying to cover as much as we had tried to cover in that paper, two new papers, two additional papers were um, uh, commissioned. Uh, one on that topic I just mentioned to you, um, the hyperregulation and bad management of research, and the other on the sort of perverse environmental influences on, on the way that medical science works, uh, notably the commercial and academic uh, perverse influences. And um, to his great credit, um, Malcolm McLeod, who, from whom you'll be hearing in a moment, uh, put together a, a wonderful paper uh, on that. <coughs> then he was told, actually, um, it's too long, we want to make it into a commentary. And in fact, in your conference packs, what you'll see now is the commentary that Malcolm led on. Um, he'll be, um, by, by video, um, telling you about that paper. And it all ended up today with the publication of uh, six papers with 44 authors from 13 countries with two introductory uh, commentaries. Actually, that's wrong. It should be five papers with two introductory commentaries. I apologize for the mistake. So what you have now um, is this series, which we hope you will find um, uh, interesting, uh, certainly challenging, uh, and important, bearing in mind um, that it's always worthwhile keeping the users of research in mind when one's judging research. And I'm talking not just about patients and clinicians, I'm talking about other researchers as well. So thank you very much for um, giving me this opportunity to make these few introductory remarks. So I'll now, I think, pass on to Bill Summerskill. Is that right, Bill? Um, you take over from, from here. So. I'm Bill Summerskill, <coughs> one of the editors at The Lancet. It's a pleasure to join you on behalf of my editorial colleague, Sabina Kleinert. Sabina, as Ian said, oversaw this series at The Lancet, uh, but regrettably cannot be here today. To meet the challenges raised by Richard, Peter, and Ian, the introductory comment and the five series papers examine opportunities to improve efficiency and value along the research continuum, from planning to publication, so that ultimately findings can inform practice. For those six items, a reporter for each publication will now present a 20-minute summary of that team's work. Then there will be an opportunity for questions after each pair of papers is presented. And I think as people pointed out, this is uh, we're here uh, to learn rather than to criticize, but also to think of the fuse that was lit in that paper in 2009, and to perhaps fan the flames, and to think where should that fuse lead? What should the ultimate goal of all of this be? So we begin with Professor Malcolm McLeod, Professor in Neurology and Translational Research, to discuss his comment uh, and that of his colleagues, which looks at the milieu in which research is conducted today and provides a vision to us of more productive alternatives.
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Malcolm McLeod from the uh, Department of Clinical Neurosciences at Edinburgh University, and I'm very pleased to be able to join you today by video. I hope, as you're watching this, that I'm in, in the middle of a ski holiday, but I also hope that I'll be able to join you this morning by Skype for, for the discussion. Uh, I understand that we've got a diverse and talented range of uh, people in the audience, and I hope that the papers that we're presenting today are uh, stimulating and interesting and helpful to you. So as we've heard already in 2009, Paul and Ian in a, a pivotal paper in The Lancet identified some key sources of avoidable waste in biomedical research. And they estimated at that time that the cumulative impact of that was that around 85% of research effort was wasted and since then, a number of us working in our own different research domains have tried to deepen that work to understand more about what makes for efficient and effective research effort uh, and what causes waste and how we might deal with the waste that arises. And we're very grateful for the opportunity to update and refresh uh, that original paper now in a series of articles which take a slightly broader scope, for instance, including in vivo research for the first time, and a more detailed analysis and the opportunity to make recommendations for action. But before I go in detail into the commentary uh, for which I'm the, the first author, I thought it important to reflect on why we consider these issues to be important. And I think largely these are issues about accountability in biomedical research. Firstly, we have accountability to the people that fund the research, the taxpayers, the people who give money to charities, uh, that the, the research which they fund is as effective, as efficient, and uh, with as little waste as is possible. To patients who are involved as subjects in our research projects, there is, of course, sometimes a small risk of harm, but more than that, there's the inconvenience for them from participation in research. And it's very important, again, that we maximize the information that we're able to gain from their participation. I think we've got uh, obligations to the people who are the potential beneficiaries of the research that's conducted. That's to say, the patients who might benefit from new treatments for their various diseases, were we able to show that those new treatments were effective. And finally, there's the issue of the use of animals in biomedical research with there being a really widespread public consensus that as long as there is a prospect that that research can help inform improvements in human health, then the use of animals in research can be justified. And so it's important for us to be able to demonstrate that in that animal research, as with the other research which we do, we, state, we take steps to maximize the efficiency and to minimize the waste in the way that we do that research. Now, since the uh, first paper in 2009, there have been some changes and some very, very welcome developments. However, at the current rate of progress, uh, it's a long, long way to go. And what we're calling for today is a step change in the way that biomedical research is funded, is regulated, performed, reported, disseminated. What we need is little short of a revolution in biomedical research if we're really serious about improving efficiency and reducing waste. So how have we got to where we are? The status quo in research is based on a complex and interdependent set of actions of diverse actors, each operating within their own systems of risks and incentives, whether they be university researchers or pharmaceutical company executives or research managers. And we can try and understand these various different uh, pressures as coming from, firstly, the capabilities of the individual, their intellectual and physical abilities to engage with the activity in question. The opportunities that that individual has, those factors external to the individual which make actions possible. And finally, the motivations for those individuals, the drivers which energize them, which direct their behaviours. And of course, in this complex system, the actions of one set of actors does a lot to determine the capabilities, the opportunities, the motivations of others. And in table one, in the commentary, we show some of the positive and the negative factors which we believed have helped shape 
uh, the current frame of biomedical research. And through understanding these, we hope to understand the economic, the political, the social and cultural factors, the causes of the causes which have shaped the research environment as it is today. So firstly, economic factors. Private companies, of course, seek to maximise profit. That's what they're there for, to return profit to shareholders. And they do this either by bringing new products to market uh, or by protecting and expanding the market share for existing products. And because of these motivations that the industry have, that's why we have regulators for the industry. And because of these regulators, that's why the industry usually does as much as it can to subvert the efforts of those regulators to implement what they want to do. And clinical research funded by industry may have distortions in study design, in the nature of the comparisons used in clinical trials. They may be seeding trials done for marketing purposes and not for science. And these drivers coming from the industry, which funds probably two thirds of biomedical research, does much to characterize health as a commodity that can be bought. And this informs and distorts the motivations of other actors in the field because of the uh, salience, the importance of industry funding. I, and it's not just, unfortunately, the pharmaceutical industry. And with a nod to our, to our hosts, medical publishing has become highly profitable. And attempts to maximize publishing income are not always consistent with an ambition to publish only research of the highest quality and of the highest relevance. Next, political factors. Governments play a, an important role in funding research, particularly where the prospect for profits for industry are limited. And in the UK, the Health Technology Assessment Programme is a great example of what can be done. For instance, a couple of years ago, they funded a trial in Bell's palsy comparing two existing treatments and showed really beyond very much doubt that corticosteroids were useful and acyclovir was not. So for a relatively small investment, they answered a clinically important question, the results of which are implemented in hospitals and GP surgeries up and down the country on a daily basis. But there are problems even with government funding. Many agencies receive their funding from governments and these are run, at least in part, by politicians who have to show every four or five years that they've done, that they've done something useful. But strategic research decisions we know can take much, much longer to bear fruit, 10, 15, 20 years. So those charged with dispersing government funds often rely on indirect or on surrogate measures of research quality. And like surrogate measures in clinical trials, these don't always measure what they claim to or what they set out to measure. These measures are usually based on the value and the number of grants awarded the number of journal publications and the impact factors of the journals in which work was published. And none of these are reliable measures of research quality. And in fact, in some cases, quite the reverse is true. And finally, uh, social and cultural factors. Uh, science is not uh, conducted by paragons of virtue, uh, living in ivory towers, unbespirched by uh, the things which affect everyone else in the world, but by individuals who are as prone to self-interest as any human. So we may compromise our usually high standards of rigor when we're involved in commercially or otherwise conflicted relationships. And when resources are scarce and competition is fierce, we may seek the easiest and the quickest rather than the best way forward. We may judge that it's better to be first and almost right than to be second and completely right when our research hunches turn out to be wrong, many move on to the next research hunch rather than going through the painstaking and difficult process of documenting and publishing their negative findings to help others who come after them. And finally, as researchers, we may prefer to do research which we find intellectually stimulating and interesting and exciting rather than research that, has, that addresses and has any real prospect of uh, developing results which improve the health of people with diseases. And complicit in these behaviors are the funders and academic institutions who set the social and cultural context in which research occurs. A focus on publication in journals uh, with high impact factor and success in securing funding leads scientists to seek short-term success 
instead of conducting the cautious, deliberative, robust research that will sub take substantially longer to produce less, ex less exciting findings, which may nonetheless have the advantage of uh, reflecting biological truth. And I can't be the only person who's disappointed to see young scientists in application for senior fellowship positions with very good ideas about how to try and sort out an area where there is uncertainty about what the right thing to do is in the light of a whole series of competing pits of information. Trying to dress this up, trying to tart this up with some exciting, new, sexy, novel, personalised medicine research idea which is really irrelevant to what it is that they uh, are trying to do and which is really much less relevant to producing good research than sorting out robust answers to difficult questions. So for scientists ambitious for success, advancement and funding, it's often easier to move with the grain of these forces than to challenge authority. Researchers may judge that the best chances of success will come from working within and working for the system, not by challenging, not by challenging it. So how do we propose that things might be different? Well, one protection from these distorting influences would be the creation of a set of counterbalancing influences which work in the opposite direction. So instead of being judged by the impact factors of the journals in which our work is published, academics might be judged on the methodological rigour of their work, on the full dissemination of their research findings, on the quality of their research reports, on the reproducibility of their findings in subsequent, in subsequent replication studies and in the implementation of their findings. And if these factors were to contribute substantially to promotion, to funding and publication decisions, institutions might even go so far as to audit the performance of their staff and where this is lacking, to take steps to improve the professional development and the appraisal of the research workforce. Science is just about the only profession that's left where entry to the profession, conventionally through the award of a PhD, is taken as a ticket for life to say that this person has the skills and the abilities to perform at their most effective as a scientist. And I doubt very much indeed if there are any scientists anywhere in the world whose performance might not be improved by some reflection, perhaps some audit, perhaps some continuing professional development with addition to their research skills, how many or how few they might already have. And so, infused with, and so by demonstrating that our, our efforts are infused with rigour from start to finish, we may protect ourselves from the sophistry of politicians. We, we can disentangle the conflicted motivations of capital and science and secure for charitable givers and taxpayers real value for money through increased research value and reduced research waste. In the papers that follow, we provide a detailed critique of how things stand, of the evidence for how things might be improved, and we provide some suggestions for how to measure progress in, against these criteria. Now, we've not, gone all, we've not gone to all this trouble to create something which is worthy, to present a report which we set on the table and then walk away, which represents an end to this process. Rather, our, our uh, recommendations represent a call, a call to action. These papers have brought together in their creation a diverse range of authors, both scientists and lay public and users of research. And we will continue to join with others to build a coalition to ensure continuing efforts to increase value and reduce waste. And as part of this, I'm delighted to be able to say that the Scottish Chief Scientist Office has agreed in principle to support with others a meeting in Edinburgh early next year which will provide the first opportunity to review progress in implementing these decisions, in, in implementing these recommendations. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I hope that in this commentary and in the papers that follow, we have made it clear that there is a pressing need to increase value and to reduce waste in biomedical research. In this series of papers, we hope that we've provided some signposts some signposts that might guide us for the next steps along the way. Thank you very much.